chat feature if you have a question for Coach. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. We will start with an opening statement of Coach Arroyo uh, about uh, today's signing class. Coach. Well, we had an uh, awesome morning. Uh, got started early, and, uh, you know, we, we've done it. Uh, these coaches done a heck of a job putting together a really good class. Before I get into that class, though, I want to make sure that that I thank a lot of people behind the scenes that make that made this um, recruiting class, this recruiting time, very very different and, and, and successful. I think um, they don't get enough credit um, for the success they have and the ability they, they they've helped us in recruiting. Um, Shelby McIntyre, Geiska Crowley, our director of recruiting and our player personnel. Um, everyone in this building, our athletic training, our strength and conditioning with Coach File, our academics with David Wedley, our video with Joe Maggio, our nutrition with Nicole Kylie, our dining hall with the chef. Um, I mean, the Fertitas, the Gons, the, the Ansets, the Beckers, the athletic department, the RAF, the Rebel Football Foundation. I mean, we recruited this group virtually. We gave tours of a facility and had to spell out and send them everything from this community and city that they can't see. They couldn't touch it, they couldn't be around it, they've never seen it. And so the credit I'm giving to all those people is because those people are the resources that provided us with virtual tours to show them an academic center, to show them the Gone Family Dining Center, to show them this amazing facility, to show them the, the Becker Field. I mean, those things, that's our recruiting tool. They didn't get a chance to come see it. The infrastructure we've got, is something we're building on, and I think that, that, that those people need to understand that those ingredients for us are really, really important, and uh, they're going to be at the foundation of every, everything we do moving forward, and I want to make sure that they get the credit that they deserve, and, and uh, we're very humbled and thankful for that opportunity. Now, I think we did a, uh, a good job of, of, of uh, conducting extensive athletic, academic, and character eval on these guys that are some our assignees that, that are uh, officially now members of the family in, in this Rebel Tw Vision 21 class. Um, our signees and families, um, I think, have full trust and confidence in our process and goals. We look forward to welcoming on campus. Um, and then we anticipate these guys having an immediate impact, very similar to the 2020 class did, and they feel ready to rise to the occasion. Again, a great group that we define in, 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 our, in our philosophy as high character, low ego, and high output. And I think uh, bringing in the top class in UOB history is something that uh, we're going to continue to try to do every year in and year out. And so um, having a sharpening a you know, being, being able to put back-to-back -back classes together like that um, helps, you know, iron sharpen iron. So we're excited. It's been an awesome morning. It's been an early morning. It's been a long day, but well worth it. And uh, and we got still a month and a half left before we get to the February part. So um, I'll, t I'll let you guys go from there and fire away before I uh, need some more coffee. Joe Rigo. Hey, Coach. Congratulations on a great class. Um, I want to first ask you about Cameron Real. Um, there's a lot of coaches I spoke to that seen a lot of characteristics and traits that reminded them of uh, Justin Herbert, who you actually, as everybody knows, you coach. Can you talk about what you've seen in Cameron in particular and if the, if the, the same traits or potential traits uh, and, and really, I guess, comparison to Herbert makes sense to you? Yeah, I mean that's obviously that, that's that's the uh, upper crust right now, and I think I think the thing that that a lot of people need to recognize with that. I guess comparison is that um, people don't know Justin had one scholarship, one or two offers coming out of high school, um, and did not have any much going on at all. Um, was uh, had a lot of uh, a lot of skill set that that you like, and some intangibles that you really like. Um, and, and, and I guess some of the examples would be obviously leadership skills, um, maturity, uh, ball placement, decision making, some mental makeup that's really good. Um, some production uh, that obviously coming from uh, both, both, both guys, um, leadership, poise in the pocket, field vision, awareness, accuracy, short and long, um, you know, I guess the ability to create second, second chances in the pocket in, 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 a, in a play, um, arm strength, touch. Uh, if those are the things that, that people are using to, to say they're comparative, that, then, then I'm good with that. I think his, his composure is good. He's got a very uh, mild-mannered young man as well. Justin was as well. Um, but I mean, I've been fortunate to be around and recruit a lot of, a lot of really special guys, man, Justin and golfs and Mullins and, and, uh, a lot of guys that we've, we've seen in the past that, that being a coach have been around. And I think, uh, Cam has got some really special tools, man. We're really excited about him. I think if this was a senior year, um, he'd be as touted as any quarterback in the country. And, um, so we're excited about him. Um, and he's got a bright future, especially as an early enrollee. 
you talk about the impact that uh, Rosas had in terms of not not keeping the class together, but the, the hype that he brings amongst the the group that you already have uh, together, this this class and the guys that he kind of talked up and, and really in the group chats and whatnot. He seemed to be like the leader of this recruiting class. Every recruiting class has one. He seemed to be that guy. Can you talk about what impact Anthony had? Yeah, Anthony was awesome. Anthony, obviously being a national guy, um, carried a lot of clout with with the recruiting world and the way it works right now. And I think, you know, what we did was developed, a, identified, and evaluated him early, and and develop and, and had some traits that we saw that were character and toughness and a, a good pedigree to him. And then we created an edge in our relationship. And then when we did that, I think that relationship and that consistency and that authenticity carried from Anthony into every other kid we recruited and he became the, the guy who carried the flag for us. You know, and I think that a lot of coaches may miss that in a lot of ways in regards to if you've got a great message with a young man and you get guys grouped together and, and you begin to be consistent um, in, in the world of recruiting nowadays, I think that goes a long ways. When, when you can have a, 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 a develop a really strong relationship and have consistency with it with authentic voices and people, Recruits pick up on that really fast, man, and they and, and they like that, and they like they, they like the fact that they can make an impact. Um, they like the fact that we've got a really good thing going on in regards to what we're developing and, and a good infrastructure and a place that's pretty special, man. So uh, Rosas was awesome. Uh, we turned him for a lot of things, and he turned to us for a lot of stuff. And I think it, it's two ways there too. You you look at your recruits a lot of time and ask them about other guys. You know, hey, what do you think about this guy we're recruiting, you know? And they can tell you a lot too. And I think that, that that's something that sometimes falls behind the, way, the, the wayside too is you can be recruiting some guys you may not know a lot about and a recruit can tell you a lot, a lot of stuff about a guy you may not want, you know, that may not fit. And so, um, but you can't do that unless you have a really good relationship. Thank you, Coach. Let's go to Jason Courts, Derek Coach, uh, I think one thing that stands out is uh, six defensive backs. So I know you're trying to build um, at, at all positions, but was that a, a position that you specifically targeted in this class? Yeah, obviously. Um, we're, the uh, roster attrition has, has been bad there. Obviously, we got we got a lot of holes to fill in a lot of places, but that one uh, significantly. So getting some length and versatility at DB with some coverage skills, play both sides of the ball, high IQ from good football programs that can play at multiple levels in the defense, the back end, second level, nickel guy safety, and can also be around the box and not afraid to put their face in there. Um, those guys have a lot of good traits, and, and we needed it there in the back end, and we found some. We feel really, really good about the guys we found. And then uh, just how important is it? I mean, I, I guess obviously, again, you're, you're going to target every position, but, you know, how important is it to maybe get some more guys, maybe in February, I know you got a couple of us uh, in this early signing period uh, up front to kind of try to build that depth there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be done there if, if, we, if we don't have to be. Um, we're also not going to just take the take. So... Um, we, we've got some options left in our pocket, which we planned on, um, but building, both building the trenches up in the way we want to play football here is important. And, uh, we've got some work to do ahead of us, but the guys we did grab, um, we're really excited about, and we had opportunities to grab other guys we decided to pass on. And I think that's something to be said too, was we weren't going to settle for guys and we're going to make the membership coming to this football program a lot harder than how it used to be. And then, uh, one local guy in the class, uh, Aaron Holloway, you know, what stands out about him and you know, how special is it to be able to keep a town like him at home? Couldn't be more fired up, man. I think one of the most explosive guys, not in Nevada, just in the West Coast, let alone the country. Um, a guy who set the standard of that school, guy who's, who's multiple with the ball, who's explosive with the ball in his hand. Um, he's got the numbers. He's got, you know, you got to make sure you find the numbers of 40 times and, and, and vertical jump or broad jump and those things that, that hold true to, to DNA and traits and explosiveness physiologically. But then they have to then they have to be on the field. They got to be on the film because there's a lot of guys that run fast and jump high that don't play fast. And and Aaron does both. He runs fast, jumps high, and plays fast, and, is, and, and can do it at a high speed, even in and out of cuts. So uh, man, I couldn't be more fired up, man. He he's exactly what what we're used to in this offense, and getting him the ball any way which can is going to be exciting. Thanks, coach. Let's go to Jesse Merrick at Channel Three. Coach, um, one kid I'm interested in is Sammy Green. I saw some of his tape. You know, seems to have a lot, a lot of burst. What's what can you kind of tell us about him? What he brings to the table? Yeah, Sammy's a, a guy. You know, one of the most explosive guys in the West Coast and most productive guys out there. Um, again, if there's not a pandemic, we're we're in a real dogfight for a guy like that playing in that league. Um, originally from Sarah there, and, and did some really good things. 
Um, but I think, you know, a lot of times people may be scared off on the height. We've had a couple guys like that at the last spot who were really explosive, but can play, uh, can, can really change direction well, really good body control, really good balance, um, can take it, you know, from first gear to, to, to 10th gear in, in a hurry and can finish. You know, it's not the, he's not the 20 yard guy three. He can take it 100 on you, but he can also be physical and play downhill and carry the ball for a, for a smaller guy a lot and carry the load, all purpose guy, you know. Um, and I, we're excited. Can catch the ball out of the backfield, has re really good special teams value, loves football, loves the contact, the physicalness of it. Um, and that piece is, is invaluable. I'm also curious to you, and I heard you say, you know, the fact that some of these kids didn't play their senior season. How, how unique was that, and, and what kind of effect did they have just kind of on the recruiting process with kids like that? Well, two part. Number one, it makes it really hard to evaluate. You, you've got to do, you've got to really trust your evaluation. I think it put a lot of a lot of schools and a lot of coaches in a in a, in a situation where, you know, it's easy nowadays to rely on someone else doing the work and giving you information. You got to go dig it back up like old school, man. You got to use the payphone and drive around a little bit. And, uh, and, and as an analogy, you got to kind of go through all the film, and you've got to be able to project without guessing. And I think that's that's important to, to state is because you can't, it, just like the draft, you just can't guess. If you don't know, you're okay not knowing, but you can't hope. You can't just, you can't just say, okay, I hope that this guy's going to be this. You can't get, you'll miss that way. And, and, and you got to be honest with yourself as a recruiter and uh, you can't be, you can't guess when it comes to the traits. You've got to make sure you've got valid scores and valid looks and, and, and reason to understand it. I think uh, you, you got to be careful in the projection based world. It's got to be based on brilliant little details you've analyzed and you've written up and you've seen and then an educated perspective. That's the, probably the last piece. And I think that we've got a, a really educated group and experienced staff. And I think we feel really, really good about the evaluation process of those guys. Doesn't mean you're not going to miss, but we were really thorough and we didn't guess. And I'm also curious too about uh, Graham Keating, a kid from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. How'd you come across him? And was he a guy, I thought I remember hearing that he had a lot of offers. What, what's kind of his story? Yeah, I mean, he's a national guy. He's got 30 plus offers. Um, uh, coach had him at camp as a young guy out there when uh, Coach Norcross was at Vanderbilt out there in Tennessee. Um, had come across him, kept the notes. A lot of these guys we kept notes on from past places we were at, and that's why we kept that relationship going. And, and, and obviously, um, you know, we were, we're, we're hoping to get a bunch of really good recruiters and staff members. It was obvious that that worked out. Coach had good notes on him and kept him in, in contact. Um, you know, Graham happens to be a hospitality major guy. He wants to go into hospitality management. Well, I mean, it was an awesome, you know, we had a, a phenomenal, he came out here uh, on his, with his parents, I think early on and um, during the pandemic and unofficially didn't walk, get, was around Vegas and walked around. We did a, all our virtual tours through around the area by the hospitality. We, we did hospitality management uh, features. We did, I mean, we built, we did a full recruiting process. And, and I think uh, it goes back to the relationship and the consistency and the authenticity and, and painting a picture that's, that's valid and not a bunch of uh, smoke. And uh, he's, a, he's a traditional kid that, that, that values that. Um, he sees the, the impact he can have. He sees the specialness of the class and it all fit together. And then uh, last one for me, I'm just kind of curious too, you know, you know, you've got guys that were at previous stops where they have notes on these kids. How much has that kind of maybe been an advantage to you guys being the newer staff that can kind of, that's already casted a wider net kind of from all over? Yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, that helps. I mean, that's part of, uh, you know, of the experience of the staff. I don't know if we have those notes if we're all brand new. I don't know if we're new to the game. You know, I think um, we've been in a lot of places. Um, we know how to recruit. We, we have trusted confidants in areas that, that we believe we can call coaches we've recruited in the areas for years I mean when you've recruited Texas for 17 years I you can make one call and get the information from the six kids you signed in Texas from three different people and you can build enough of a file to get pertinent information you've got a relationship where the coach trusts you and your development of what you've done maybe at other stops and so you combine that with all the assistance and all the stops we've got and we got a pretty good Rolodex that we can call and, 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 and rely on. And I think people trust us. And, um, and I think we've, we've painted a picture here for what we think we can get done. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. We're trying to fish off. Uh, Marcus, based on recruiting rankings, the bottom half of both of your classes here have been better than the bottom half of pretty much any other UNLV class. Is that the biggest key to actually building depth on your roster? Um, be more specific, Todd. Do you mean rank? Do rankings help us build our roster? I'm confused. No, just like the fact that you, 
is not just the, the top half of your class that's been good, it's the bottom half of your class that's been better than what UNLV has had in the past. I got you. Yeah, I think, I think uh, if I'm going to answer it correctly, I think as a, as a whole, from top to bottom, I think that when you're trying to build it the right way, the quality of the guy, it can't be you got two great players in a class and you're like, oh, we can make a difference. It doesn't work on a football roster that way. You got, especially in the infant stages, you have too many holes to fill. You know, one guy can't make that much of a difference. Now, one guy can make a huge difference, particularly say you get, I mean, an elite quarterback. But even then, if you don't got the right guys around him, it's not going to work well. I think that, uh, you know, the quality of the players we've got at all positions from top to bottom, I think, help do bolster your roster and, and raise the level of competitiveness, let alone quality of player. And I think in turn, the, the, the point there is you, you get a chance to be competitive at a higher level. And then uh, just how much was a selling point to this class about playing immediately? Um, it was probably one big, one big piece. I think one big piece. I think that's a piece nowadays that, that's happening with a lot of people. I mean, there's a hundred, I mean, 120 guys went in the portal in like 48 hours, like, last week or something crazy, some astronomical number, it's evident that all these guys have time. They all want to play, you know? And I think right now it's never more than ever. They're looking at those numbers going, wait a minute, you know, I, I don't I want to go be productive. I want to go play. And so where can I get quality coaching? Where can I get infrastructure? Where can I get a good environment uh, where I can grow and, and, and be, and be more than football. And um, I think that's what you're seeing more and more. It doesn't mean you're going to get every kid, you know, every, you're going to get every, you know, blue chip kid in the country to go anywhere. But I think at the end of the day, uh, painting a picture for a guy to have success and some of the, some of the, you know, unfortunate, you know, opportunities we've had in the NFL, we can paint a picture that it's, it's about playing time. If that's your goal on a Sunday, it's about games and playing time. Do you have to have elite talent? Yeah, sure you do, but you can't have elite talent and not play. Um, and at the end of the day, when you do the math of the guys who were, who were playing on Sundays, we've all seen those rankings and how those play out. So, it's, it's, it's more than the rankings of guys and star quality. It's more about uh, the production, the coaching, uh, and, and I think the, uh, the opportunities. The Mike Grimal of the Sun. Yeah, Coach, somewhat along those lines, um, Cameron Frail, based on some of the, the traits you were talking about earlier, um, and assuming that you have a somewhat normal offseason, you know, with spring and, and training camp and all that, is he a guy that could compete to, to – get that starting job next year at quarterback? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to, uh, we've had multiple freshmen in our in, in my past that have, that have had a chance to compete and, and adjust quickly. Um, I don't know why, why it would, we don't have uh, no heir apparent. We've got no three year starter who's a, you know, um, a, um, a draftable guy that's gonna be, oh man, you're not gonna, it's gonna be hard to come in here in Herbert's third year, you know, but, um, we don't have that, unfortunately. We, we've got we've got a great uh, young group. We got a great great guy in, in Doug. We got a couple guys behind him there. Um, I don't think that that that, uh, that coming in and competing for uh, for the job is out of the question at, at all. And uh, Nick Demetrius is a guy who you know ranked very highly in the in the class. He decommitted for about a week. Um, can you just sort of take me through that process of decommitting, getting him back in the fold, and how? You know, relieved or excited were you to, to finally get him, you know, uh, completely committed today? Yeah, I mean, that's it's not uh, that's not uncommon, actually. Um, it's not uncommon for guys to uh, call it what you want. Hear something else, go through something. Nick was going through something in his life, actually, that, that made him make pause in a lot of in a lot of things. Um, and I think when you got a relationship that, that me and Nick had, I think we totally understood. We talked long before he decommitted. And I said, you know what? This has got to be a two-way street. You know, there's going to be demands and, and, and asked of you at this level um, when you get here that you've got to trust that that I'm going to ask you in the right ways, and I got to trust you're going to give it back. And so, if we're not on the same page or we don't feel you don't feel this is somewhere that that's going to fit, whether it's Nick or it's anybody in the country, I think it's only I think it's only smart for guys to step away for a second, catch your breath, and maybe deal with whatever they want to do, whether it's a recruiting thought or it's some family issues. I think. Um, we're humble enough. We've got low enough ego here, and 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 humane enough in the way who we are and the way we recruit. It was an easy conversation when that took place, and then we followed up and we stayed in contact the entire time. We communicated effectively. Uh, we weren't the guys on the way out that said something rude or something demeaning, which happens a lot. Uh, I think guys can guys can walk away from the school and you hear a lot of slander stuff, and they and unfortunately they get on and they they read all the just cr crud that just you know, basically smears their name as an 18 year old. And 
then you can actually lose those kids. You can lose them and you didn't even mean to. Someone else did. And uh, we kept a healthy dialogue. And, um, and, I, and, and, and he ain't coming back with something we were all in the same boat with and there was never any bad blood or anything, man. He just, he needed a moment to catch his breath. He's 18, going through a lot in his life and going through a huge decision. And um, that's fair. And then uh, just as a player, what can you say about, about Nick and what you think he's going to bring to the program? Well, he's got he's, he's he's raw, man. He's raw. He's got a, a huge upside, uh, great length, great growth potential. He's tough. He likes football. He's passionate. Um, he can play as a pass rusher. He's going to be able to be stout. We've got to put a little, some muscle on him and give him the weight room, develop him as far as scheme goes, and some and some traits and in, in the development of, uh, of of individual drills and, and things like that. But um, he's got he's got some of that it now, and and so we're excited about that. All right, we're going to try Chris Matthews at Channel 8. Chris, can you... Marcus, can you hear me? I got you, Chris. All right. Hey, I was just curious, what's the difference now going into an area, talking to these head coaches, these different contacts that you have in the area as a head coach as opposed to a coordinator in a different capacity? Did you notice any kind of... Was there anything kind of different in the way you approach things or the way they they you know talked back to you or, or, or got back to you or... I just kind of wonder if there's any kind of a difference. Not at all. I have, I've, I've, I've treated every coach uh, in my mind, at least the ones I feel like I can go through the phone and call at any second about recruits, the same as when I was a position coach in my first job in Texas, all the way to a coordinator at any stop I'm, with respect. And I've been thorough. I think coaches, I think any coach who's getting his kid recruited wants to see someone who's thorough and honest, has integrity, communicates effectively, and is doing the right things for his kids. And I think when you build up that with uh, with coaches in the country around at high, local high schools, I don't think it matters what your title is. I don't think I don't think it matters if you're the head coach or the coordinator. I think that he respects the fact that you do the right job, you communicate with his family, you do the things to help his kids, and um, I think that's it. The other part, if it is any change in the dialogue, I think that's all superficial. At the end of the day, he's going to answer your call because he respects you and give you the right information because of what you've done. Another question I have is kind of what's the feedback from maybe athletes? So you got this. Terrific class coming in, um, you know, top 60 in the country, one or two in the Mountain West. What are people kind of saying, maybe athletes or coaches or parents, about what you guys as a group are doing here? You know, that, that's hard. To, I, you'd be better answer that than I have. I, I think all, the only people I've communicated with, Chris, would be um, the people that have been integral in our program um, and, the, and, and, and helping us recruit these kids, the families that they've got, um, our staff. Uh, they're coaches, and I think, um, you know, when I ask them exactly what are the things that are helping you define this moment, I think that they're, they're saying things that, that are important to us and in, in, in the culture. I think they're seeing character coaches. Um, they're having authentic conversations that are pushing kids, that have developed kids in the past, that are at a place now where they feel we feel really, really optimistic about the infrastructure and the things we can do here. And I think at the end of the day, that dialogue is something that is uh, that, that's, that's obviously served uh, – I'm successful for us, and we'll continue to do that way. Final question for me is, what's it like back in the day when you had to sit in front of a fax machine and, and kind of wait for, for that fax to come over? Now it's, it's such a small world and everything is just so immediate. Um, did, 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 did you lose any guys later? How Just how that changes with the whole recruiting thing and, and getting that commitment? Well, we didn't lose anybody. We, we were we kept all our guys as you know we actually changed changed directions on a few guys late because I felt we didn't have enough information I felt like I, we're not settling if there's a void and and, and I, I'm not doing that I'm, I'm, I'm into making making a, a very comprehensive look at, at what who we're bringing in and why and if there's anything that's we were and, and we communicated moving different directions it wasn't just you hang up the phone and stop texting guys that, that's not the way to go man um, that's not the way you treat people. They got people below them who are going to look up to you and call them and they're going to call them. Hey, how do you recruit you? Um, the fax machine. Yeah, that's holy cow. Those, those were, those were the days. Now you'd freak out because you'd have to, I mean, the perfect exact a fax machine in my town, the fax machine in my town, I think if it was a bad weather day, I wasn't getting to it now. That's a dirt road or snow. It's in the, it's in the back. It was in the back of the butcher shop. If it was closed on a certain day, I wasn't getting to that. You know, it's just the way it was. And you know, they're fax machines nowadays. I mean, should we get enough hard, hard enough time with text messages nowadays and getting those things sent? A fax machine, that's a, 
that's like who that's like horse and carriage but it, it was it was it was interesting back then i i now i don't want to mention any names but i know there's some schools that still have one pretty close to pretty close to reach and uh i think that that, that that's an interesting facet i think you want to do a quick study on who on, on, on what who's got the fax machine still i'd be oh, i'd be careful well, Coach, congratulations. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate you guys. Thanks. Let's, um, let's go back to Joe Rico. Coach, I think that the one player in this class that could be considered a sleeper is Anton. Um, he's got a very interesting story with moving schools. He, he's the big-time guy. How do you feel about, about being able to lock him in? I, I'm, I'm pretty, I assume you're pretty excited about him. Man, I think I think he hit right in the head. I think Anton is the, is one of the one of the sleepers of the class um, for sure. I mean, he's one. I mean, there's a lot of guys here. I'm. I'm it's gonna say you, 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 if you're in a pandemic, you're in a dogfight now. I mean, you're not in one. If you're out regular recruiting and you're trying to get some of these guys we got here on a, on a regular deal without the relationship that we built, um, you're in a dogfight. Don't mean we wouldn't close them out because I'm. I, I know we'd close them out. But Anton being six six at Bosco hadn't been at Calabasas. You're talking about two of the powerhouse teams in California. They're going to be on every channel every Saturday. There's going to be there's going to be 60 to 100 coaches on each sideline every Friday night at those games, playing against premier talent on national TV for state and national titles. A 6'6", 275 pound tackle with great grades, a great family who's got three bro two brothers that play Division One sports. He's not going to slip through the crack. Now it just so happened that I saw him when he was a puppy when I was recruiting his quarterback brother, and his brother sent me a little.